Welcome to the Global Gurus Conclave 2019, ma'am. So how is it uh, being at an educational conclave like this for you? Well, it's always interesting to meet uh, people from a cross-section of um, the education sector. Um, so it's, it's very in, uh, interesting to see schools and universities um, and some of the regulators as well all in one place um, discussing um, common issues but hopefully also finding solutions. <laughs> <laughs> so let's also talk about what Global Education Solutions primarily does. Okay, so Global Education Solutions is uh, Melbourne headquartered strategic consulting organization in education. Okay. Uh, we're probably one of the very few who work across sector. Okay. Um, so we work with schools and universities, colleges, vocational training institutions, research institutions, government agencies, as well as employers and industry bodies. So uh, we actually from a vantage point can see um, the real issues mm. and uh, which can be resolved by mostly connecting the dots right. and breaking down barriers because people tend to work in silos. So uh, while we are at an education conclave and we have all the education institutes here, so uh, listening to them, what do you think is the gap that has to be bridged and what are the solutions that you at your own end can provide to these problems that an Indian, Indian institution is ailing? Well, from the various sessions I've attended today, uh, clearly I think enhancing employability and entrepreneurship is, is very topical hmm. and the need of the hour. Okay. Um, there was also a lot of discussion on um, you know, where we are heading in the future. There's a lot of constant change and uncertainty and Industrial Revolution 4.0. So what are the competencies that young people need uh, to thrive in such an environment where jobs are being constantly altered and there are new jobs that we don't know that will be created mm. by the time the student graduates and enters the workforce. Now is this an issue only for higher education and employers? No. I think it's a shared responsibility right. and it logically has to start in school. Okay. Because uh, in the adolescent phase especially, that's when uh, psychologically you're developing your unconscious biases, um, your value systems, um, your preferences, the foundational skills for study, work and life. Mm. And uh, alongside the academic rigor, which India is very well known for and emphasis on marks, there must be a parallel stream focused on developing people. Right. Um, so helping every child uh, not just identify their potential, but also connect it to the future world of work. Right. Uh, so they need, to, I mean, there's a lot of emphasis on 21st century skills and experiential learning and all the rest of it. Hmm. But the student needs to be aware of how they're acquiring these skills, not just through the classroom, but learning outside the classroom, mm. at home. So you acquire skills through a number of different ways. You need to be aware of those skills and you need to know how to apply it in their life right now. Okay. And using those skill sets, what you can possibly do in future, which occupations or groups uh, lends itself to a person with that sort of a profile. Right. So they need to connect themselves with the community and the world of work. And that's a very complex skill. Hmm. It's a big ask. So clearly it can't, be ha it can't happen overnight. Right. And you've got to do it continuously in a structured way hmm. and it has to be given equal importance in the curriculum. And I think that was what I found is the missing gap, is okay. the missing link. Yeah. Okay. So um, when you hear the educationist talking, do you 
and the solution that they provide and while you are in the in the business of providing solutions to all the problems that are prevailing what do you think are is the plausibility and practicality of the solutions that ca are currently going on and are uh, what is the kind of awareness that there is in in, in the institutions for them for the kind of things that they are endeavoring or working upon f uh, in future i think um Everybody uh, um, is doing their best, I can say, to resolve this um, in their own sector. But mm. this needs uh, cross-sector pollination. All right. So you need somebody to bridge the gap and connect uh, government um, employers, um, tertiary educators with s the school system. Mm. Otherwise, I think the problem is not going to really get addressed. Right. Uh, there will be uh, many good uh, uh, solutions, but um, they will not be holistic or integrated. Okay. I think that's very crucial. So, uh, whenever you're providing such solutions, what do you think is the <coughs> yardstick, or how do you think are you evaluate? How do you evaluate the solution that are pro that you're providing in comparison to the pr um, problems, or maybe the other so the other solution that are already prevailing in my maybe other countries? Mm. Yeah, I think um, measurability and scalability is very key, especially for a country like India. Okay. Uh, any solution and therefore it has to be technology enabled right it also needs to be personalized to mm -hmm. a large extent because every person is very unique and there's no one size fits all mm. so using technology it is possible um, to um, help bring about this transformation at an individual level but also measure the outcomes at a school level at, at a community level and also do some longitudinal tracking to see what is the impact of this on the Indian economy. Okay. You know, are we producing more employable graduates? Are we producing uh, more entrepreneurs who will create mm. the jobs of the future? Um, are we producing more innovators and overall is the Indian economy becoming more competitive right. because of the uh, large skilled resources mm. within the country. So I think there are a number of ways to measure these outcomes on a continuous basis. Um, you were talking about these problems that are rooting from the grassroots level, from the school. Mm. What do you think is the primary problem that Indian education in the school level is facing <laughs> right now? <laughs> Well, there's a lot of uh, changes, maybe, maybe not as rapid as it should be. Yeah. I mean, it's moved away from the traditional rote learning to, uh, at least in some segments, um, to more uh, experiential and project-based or outcome-based hmm. learning. Um, but I think um, that is uh, the first step because you need to not just acquire knowledge, but you need to know how to apply it uh, in today's setting and also what will be the future application of these knowledge. And some will have to become knowledge creators right. uh, themselves. Um, but I, I would say uh, to bring about a systemic change, um, what we call career education mm -hmm. is definitely needed. And to share an Australian uh, experience. Um, Australia has the Australian Blueprint for Career Development, okay. which um, is like a lifelong learning framework. And it focuses on building different competencies hmm. um, at various stages of your life as you go, as to help you thrive in this world of complexity okay. and constant change. Um, so there must be, um, that should become mandated. So right. whether you have a state board or a national curriculum or an international board, I think career education and career learning um, across the curriculum, uh, I would like to see it as the change that India is waiting for. Uh, let's talk about something, uh, let's talk about the issue where um, course versus college comes into place. So there are times when our students would rather opt for a good college than a good course that they would want to pursue. Say, 
say a person who might choose IIT merely because of the brand mm -hmm. rather and choose a textile engineering if even if the person wants to do CSE. So what do you think? Why is it um, that this thing is prevailing? What do you have to say about that? Again, that's one of its um, lack of one of the competencies, which is decision making, <laughs> informed decision making. Right. Uh, I would um, recommend that young people look at not just the entry into the college or a course, but yeah. where it leads to. Hmm. Uh, the outcome should be kept in mind, and then reverse engineered okay. to uh, decide on which course or training will help them get to that outcome. So hmm. I think finding a sense of direction, some purpose um, while you're at school um, and then creating your own roadmap of possibilities right. uh, and use that to work out which is the best fit for you because hmm. um, yeah, everyone has to make uh, a unique decision. Uh, Ma'am, if we are to consider about um, the education at the graduation or the post-graduation level and evaluate our system mm. so um, and look at also look at the rankings of u various universities mm. India does not come in the top 200 n not even one institute and uh, if in fact if the, if we are to consider um, one of the top institutes that we have IISC so that has also dropped its ranking why do you think in uh, comparison to the global board or the global platforms or the global education all in all what is it that the India that India is lacking or is not able to cover up for um, the advancements or maybe mm. the technological accomplishments that they're not able mm. to make? I think uh, there are different ways of evaluating quality and rankings is one such metric. Uh, and if you look at most of the renowned rankings, mm. uh, there's a lot of importance given to research. Yeah. Um, so, you know, publishing in journals, commercialization mm. of research, the patents that you right. produce, your research facilities on campus, the quality of your faculty, the quality of your students. So that's one. And then the other one is the outcomes of the graduate. Mm. So they track actually the employability outcomes, um, some of them the experience of students. So I think um, uh, for us, if we are going to use that as a, uh, a metric mm. and move up the research rankings, um, then I guess we've got to develop that uh, research mentality in young people again right from sc the school. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, most solutions start at school level where you've got to develop um, curiosity, interest, um, research methodology, how mm. do you validate your findings, um, uh, you've got to be cognizant to um, producing your original work versus copy pasting somebody right. else's work, mm. um, be mindful of plagiarism, right. you know, so I think uh, if we create a research uh, ecosystem starting mm. from the school level mm. and that would definitely permeate into higher education and hopefully we get more students looking at uh, research as an option right. because uh, to produce a good research institution you not just need facilities but you need good students and good Correct. faculty Correct. and um, uh, so I think one way to do this is to start young. Uh, so uh, j you just talked about commercialization, taking that word and putting it into our education sector. So do you think that the commercialization of different institutes of uh, uh, in the current education is hampering the um, progress of the education system in our country? So, so your mindset. So in the name of uh, so even if I'm talk if I'm to talk about privatization of universities, um, in the name of profitability, mm. do you think they're also they're compromising on maybe the faculty, the quality of education, and not at trying to advance themselves in terms of curriculum? I think it's uh, there's no short answer to it because um, each institution is quite different. Yeah their intentions might be different, their motives are quite different. So you can't really have like a blanket statement to um, characterize um, uh, different people. But I think uh, in a country like India, privatization is definitely uh, unavoidable mm. because you we are not China, so you can't right. expect government to be the only 
um, uh, source of funding and to set up new institutions. Mm. Um, so, but I think there is a balance between um, being self-regulated and complying with, um, say, quality reforms. And uh, it would be good, uh, I mean, education is, um, if you're not receiving government funding, mm. um, clearly you've got to have a profit center. Yeah. And like any industry, I think uh, very soon the customer will regulate whether you're in business or not. Right. So if, you, if the students feel there are good outcomes, there are these great facilities and they're willing to pay for it, hmm. uh, why not? You know, I think, but the students should be able to choose hmm. um, where they want to study and what they're prepared to pay for. Okay. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think there there must be some level of self-regulation as well in um, the profitability of it. All right. I really think what you're doing is really great, and I think it is in need of thought. I hope what you're trying to do bridges the gap that uh, our education system requires. Thank you so much for talking. Talk, talking oh, lovely to chatting us. with you. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank you so much.